I'm a nurse by trade, and I, if a patient were to come in saying they were giving their kid cannabis, I would like call Child Protective Services mm. Agency on them. So for me, having reversed my whole stance, having understood we actually have an endocannabinoid system, what a unique thing. Um, definitely not taught in nursing school, definitely not taught by other health care providers. So, mm. I mean, I'm sort of on a mission to bring the patient's let them use their voice and actually be a solution rather than problems. This is the Cannabis Enigma, cutting through the smoke to have informed, serious conversations for regular people. I'm Alana Goldberg. And I'm Dr. Cody Peterson. So we've got a super interesting episode today. This was one of my favorite interviews that I recorded the sidelines of MJ BizCon in Las Vegas in October this year. I interviewed Nikki Lawley, who is a traumatic brain injury survivor. And since her brain injury and subsequently finding cannabis as a medicine, she's become a staunch advocate for therapeutic use of the plant. And we caught up not only on the sidelines of the conference, but sitting on the floor around the corner. I'll, I'll put a photo in the show notes actually <laughs> so everyone can see. Sitting around the corner, Nikki was wearing this jacket that was making too much noise as we were recording. So she actually decided to just take off the jacket. So we recorded in her like sports gear, like crop top and leggings. And we had maintenance staff like coming past. So I will note that if there are any loud kind of rumbling noises that you hear, that was the maintenance staff kind of rolling their, their carts past us. But anyway, I won't tell too much about the interview because really Nikki tells her whole story and I don't need to kind of summarize her, her words for you all. But I did think, Cody, this could be a good chance for you to kind of give a bit of an introduction to cannabis use for, for TBI, for traumatic brain injury. Absolutely. Well, I know Nikki. We're connected on LinkedIn. I'm a little jealous you got to meet her. It was, the interview was the day before I got to meet Alana in, in Vegas right. for yeah. MJ BizCon. But sure, you know, Nikki's not the first person to use cannabis as medicine to, to help with traumatic brain injury. When we get traumatic brain injury, there's an insult to the brain. Usually, essentially, it can be a bruise or, or even worse than that, a bleed or a blood clot. And those sort that sort of damage is essentially irreparable. Not completely, but the brain doesn't heal well. It's notoriously difficult to heal. And so it turns out that when it is injured, the endocannabinoid system actually responds to that injury and, and sort of upregulates itself, turns up the volume on the ECS. And we think now that as more and more data is becoming available, that cannabis could be a very useful treatment. Both THC and CBD have shown promise in helping with the inflammation and some of the damage that has occurred in the so this is not just foo-foo. There's plenty of early evidence to suggest that there might be something here about cannabinoids as neuroprotectants and also as neurogenic uh, helpers and sort of helping us heal our brain. So I can't wait to hear how cannabis has helped Nikki in her journey recovering from traumatic brain injury. Yeah, well, that was certainly her experience. Actually, I remember reading some really interesting research about cannabis and TBI. And like, as you would imagine, it's kind of difficult to study this therapy because you have to cause people traumatic brain injury in order to then give them cannabis. And so what this study that, and I think there are a couple more like it as well, the way they did it was actually looked at people who had suffered a traumatic brain injury and had coincidentally also used cannabis beforehand and then compared the effect TBI sufferers who had not used cannabis beforehand and were able to start kind of drawing some insights from that. Yeah, and these types of studies are, are not perfect, but they can sh shed a lot, like you said, a lot of insights into what might be happening. And some of those early studies do suggest that cannabis might be protecting brains and, and helping brains recover. And so really, we now need to continue to build on the science we have and explore cannabis as medicine and cannabinoid science, my favorite topic. Definitely. All right. So let's go straight to the interview. Uh, stick around. Also, after the interview, we've got a special segment from Americans from Safe Access, uh, who are our partners, of course, on the Cannabis Enigma. So yeah, let's listen to Nikki. here at the moment at MJ BizCon in Las Vegas with Nikki Lawley, who is a cannabis patient and advocate and has her own company, Nikki on the Plan. 
So, Nikki, first of all, thank you very much for joining me here today. Absolutely. It's an absolute pleasure to be here with you, Elena. Just to kind of set the scene a little bit for our listeners, we're currently sitting at in some corner of the exhibition centre. We've found the floor. We're both sitting cross-legged on the floor for this interview. So any sort of background noise you hear will be other uh, conference attendees walking past. Sometimes there are these little buggies that come past as well. So apologies for the noise, but we are sitting here at the conference. This is a bit of the atmosphere that you might be able to hear a bit in the background. How's the conference been for you so far? This is my first time to the convention center today, oh, wow. uh, this trip, mm-hmm. but so far so good. I'm meeting you. Yeah, yeah. Good start to the day. So, Nikki, I would love if you can start off just telling us about your story. Sure. I was injured in October of 2016. Child did not want a vaccine and hit me frontally. I bounced off a wall and back into his head. That caused like a traumatic brain injury as well as cervical instability and my life's never been the same since. I was in a very dark place. I was on over 60 different pharmaceuticals, and then I saw over 50 specialists all across our country as well as Canada, and the journey was really dehumanizing almost. Having been a successful pediatric nurse, being able to talk the talk, walk the talk, and then becoming a patient. So going from provider, caregiver, to patient was a huge adjustment for me. What's kind of weird is we're here at MJ VizCon and January 24th of 2017, my life was actually saved in Las Vegas because I found medical cannabis. A billboard was coming down the strip and I was planning my death. I was trying to figure out how to jump and not be more screwed up. And literally a billboard came by saying, get your medical Nevada card here today. And all I could see was the uh, egg frying someone's head, mm. you know, on, you know, your brain on drugs. And having a traumatic brain injury, you know, I couldn't see where cannabis was going to be my answer after being fed the negative propaganda, of, you know, the whole war on drugs and all that stuff. But mm-hmm. my husband was like, yes, let's go. You know, you've smoked pot in the past and that's made you laugh. So let's try that because I was in a truly despondent state. I could not literally leave my hotel room. And so finding medical cannabis was like eye-opening for me. My first dispensary trip was absolutely overwhelming, didn't have any clue. Luckily, the bud tender was very patient with me. And, you know, I was like a kid in a candy store that doesn't know if the candy is going to be any good. And (laughs) I really didn't know where to start, quite honestly. And so bud tender did what any guy would probably do, and that's just recommended really heavily sedating type terpenes. And like for me, I find the whole plant and smoking it works the best for my medical situations. Mm -hmm. It's all about the terpenes for me. So the entourage of the whole plant with specific terpenes, specific genetics really set life apart for me and really are game changing. Wow. So there's a bunch of things I want to drill into in that story. So so tell me a bit more, first of all, about that first uh, dispensary experience. So you went in there, you've got your medical cannabis license for the first time. You've smoked cannabis in the past, but you've never thought of it as medicine before. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So how did you go about, like, what questions were you even asking the bud tender the, the first time? So I was in Vegas three days and I had not left my hotel room the mm-hmm. entire time. So... Going there, I was just literally, it was a huge big deal for me to just even get out of the car. So, I mean, asking questions was like, how can I function? How can I sleep? How can I not be in pain? Mm -hmm. I had insane anxiety, depression, and I literally lost my purpose. And so the bud tender recommended like high mercine strains and, you know, really sedating things. And He also gave me gummies, tinctures, and various edible type things. Mm -hmm. What I found, I got no relief from, and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, well, this doesn't work. And so it was kind of frustrating, you know, trying to figure out, well, why isn't this working for me the way they advertised it should? Or and so I have a unique digestive system. I don't absorb fat soluble products very well, so Mm -hmm. that includes THC and CBD, and so I have no gallbladder and. I had weight loss surgery many mm-hmm. years ago. So that's why they didn't have an effect. But it took me years to understand that, thinking I just had this incredible tolerance that I could bow down a thousand milligrams of THC and feel nothing. It wow, was, so, so you actually were breaking it down. 
Right. I don't break it down at mm-hmm. all. It's and how did you find this out? Did you, was it just your own trial and error or did you have healthcare providers and experts that helped you? I wish I had a healthcare <laughs> provider help me. Honestly, it was trial and error. So when I came from Las Vegas getting my medical card, I then had to come back to New York where I live. And in New York, chronic pain was not on our list of approved conditions. And we don't have any flour in New York at the time. And so I became a medical cannabis refugee in Canada. And I learned all about the plant and what works. And I used this great application that like tracked my usage and helped me understand what terpenes, what minor cannabinoids Mm -hmm. actually were. Specific strain names I learned really mean nothing. Blueberry Kush from Can Trust versus Blueberry Kush from Canopy Growth is a completely different experience. And one is a hybrid, one is, and again, I hate indica sativa hybrid words to me. That is not helping things. It should be more, Mersin tends to be more of a indica couch, (laughs) indica type concept, not so much just a name. You know, look at the whole profile, look at the whole chemical composition of the flower. Right. So, I mean, as you know, at the Conigma, this is what we do, um, kind of making this sort of information accessible to anyone who needs it, like you know, you like you did, really, at that time. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, Conigma did not exist at that time. And I guess what I'm hearing is that for you, you had to go through that whole process by yourself and just kind of figure out each little bit by yourself. What made you stick at it? That is a good question. Luckily, I had friends in Canada that were mm. willing to let me stay with them for weeks at a time. And mm-hmm. they're like, hey, if that weed stuff helped you in Vegas, we can get that stuff in our medical program all day long. Let us help you. Right. And so I would literally go to Canada. And one day, it was kind of unique. I was talking to my husband. And he's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what do you mean what's wrong with me? He's like, you're laughing. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he's like... I said, I'm actually playing Scrabble right now, and I'm actually winning. (laughs) And um, he's like, what are you using? Why are you so happy? And, I mean, like, he literally had been through six months of literal hell of my depression and pain and journey and feeling hopeless and worthless. And so this was a huge, you know, 180. And literally that day I really said, I'm onto something. This might actually work for me. And... It was the help of the app. It was the help of, honestly, my network. I've Mm -hmm. had so many humans with brain injury, without brain injury, cannabis nurses, cannabis, you know, I've had so much support and my network has just grown exponentially. I have like a crazy amount of followers that just really care about the story and want to see me, you know, repair the world. <laughs> it's like Uno Lam, baby. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, so tell me about that, that network and what you're doing it, about it, with it, I suppose, and Nikki and the Plant. So Nikki and the Plant is promoting advocacy and awareness. Mm-hmm. We're really trying to focus on women and brain injury especially. Mm-hmm. It's crazy how many people have a brain injury that you would have never guessed or right. a concussion or having lasting symptoms that they never thought they would still have. Mm -hmm. So Nikki and the Plants planning on launching a brain health, uh, brain injury product line Mm -hmm. with resources and education, a closed loop system that really ties the providers, the patients, and life hacks and a way of dealing with brain injury. Cannabis is a tool. It's not a cure. Yeah, definitely. All right, so we'll be really excited to, to see those products when you launch them. Make sure you, you keep us posted. Oh, I will, for um, sure. Tell us a bit more about what you're planning. So it's really about wellness and mm. teaching people and helping remove the stigma. I'm a nurse by trade, and I, if a patient were to come in saying they were giving their kid cannabis, I would, like, call Child Protective Services mm. Agency on them. So for me, having reversed my whole stance, having – understood we actually have an endocannabinoid system. What a unique thing. Um, definitely not taught in nursing school, definitely not taught by other health care providers. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sort of on a mission to bring the patients, let them use their voice and actually be a solution rather than problems. You know, really helping to articulate the benefits of cannabis, articulate the reasons that cannabis can be used for wellness and Mm -hmm. help so many people. I mean, anxiety and depression are running rampant since COVID. And giving people hope is like, I think, what keeps me going. 
every day someone reaches out, whether it's on a Facebook post or an Insta post or even LinkedIn, saying, you know, keep going. Your story really helped me understand this or that or the other thing. Or I had a TBI too, and cannabis is the only thing that helps me. And of course, you do get some naysayers saying, if you're smoking cannabis, you're just getting high. If you prefer high THC products, then you're truly just to get stoned. I don't get stoned. I get medicated. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need to relearn in society. I think people immediately hear marijuana or cannabis and they immediately think, pothead, lazy, on the couch with Scooby snacks, hanging out. Right. And I had that perception. So, I mean, kudos that I, you know, reversed my position because I think even though I was injured, everything happens for a reason. And I truly, truly believe that my purpose is much bigger now than I ever was as a mm. nurse. And I believe that lives are changing because of my story. Yeah, absolutely. That must be a good feeling. It really is. It's giving back. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a true giver and really want to see people do well. I want to collaborate with the right people and make something really unique and cool happen. Yeah, I hear that. So, so I'm thinking about these naysayers, okay? I mean, it's obvious that the reason your uh, view changed so, so starkly um, about cannabis is because of your own experience, but not everyone is lucky, quote unquote, enough to have an experience that will change them. And so, you know, we need advocates. So what do you say to people who, who would say something to you, like you said, like if you're using high THC products, all you're trying to do here is get high. How do you kind of start this conversation and, and start changing minds and breaking down that stigma? Funny you mentioned that. I recently was at a board meeting and they were debating in New York State whether we want to have cannabis consumption and retail on my little island. Mm -hmm. And it was very negative energy in there. Mm -hmm. And I got up and I literally looked at each and every board member and I said, this plant saved my life mm -hmm. and I should have access to it. Mm -hmm. I should have safe consumption and I should not have to leave the island to medicate. Right. And I changed three of those mem board members and now I'm having a round table discussion about just ask me anything. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's remove the stigma. After I spoke, Literally on the way out, I was accosted <laughs> by a naysayer, exactly what you're describing. Mm -hmm. And if I had a recording of every single thing he said to me, you could not have defined the whole war on drugs any better. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a gateway drug. The war on drugs is working. I mean, every single thing. And I just came back with an educated response. And why do you feel that way? Mm -hmm. You know? To get a dispensary here, we're not going to be able to, you know, market it to 12-year-olds. You know, yeah. we aren't trying to medicate children for no reason. Mm -hmm. So getting people to understand that, and I think I definitely am not considered the typical stoner appearance. So I think that makes people kind of sit back, think, listen, mm -hmm. and learn more. Right. It kind of like breaks the stereotypes that they've got, and so it leaves room for... I don't know, for an opinion to change, I suppose, or a point of view. So it, it's really kind of grassroots activism what you're doing here. You're talking to people one by one, changing their points of view. Does your social media activity kind of fall into that a lot? And what other channels are you using? Yes. I've had so many people share my story on their podcasts, on their shows. And I also have an incredible social media following. I'm kind of at max connections everywhere. So people can follow me, but... I can follow them back, but I usually can't friend them or accept a connection request. Mm -hmm. Not because I don't want to, but because I'm at max. 30,000 max for LinkedIn and Good 5, problems 000. to have. I mean, it, people say that to me all the time, and like 90% of my LinkedIn connects are vetted. Cannabis or TBI or, you know, legitimate connects. And so... It's pretty cool when you see that kind of reach. You know, my posts reach 17,000 a day, you know. and wow, I mean, amazing. for somebody that's completely a techno moron, yeah, it's okay. It's, it's all organic. Um, I just recently started using hashtags. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm noticing a lot more activity because, because of that. But, yeah, um, yeah my NikkiInThePlant.org page is also getting a lot more hits, but... Again, just trying to find the right people to build your team to make sure that 
all that technical stuff is handled because that is not my strength. It's right. really more sharing the story, bringing plant awareness, helping others. Right. Well, super powerful story. Thank um, you. I'm glad we finally had the chance to get you on the podcast and share it with our listeners. We'll put in the show notes a link to Nikki and the Plant. Anywhere else that we should tell people to find you or to follow what you're doing? Sure. Please follow me on uh, LinkedIn, Nikki Lolly, or Instagram, Nikki and the Plant, mm-hmm. as well as Facebook, Nikki and the Plant, or Nikki Lolly. Got it. So Nikki Lolly and Nikki and the Plant everywhere, basically, everywhere. to find you there. <laughs> and we look forward to seeing uh, the product line which launched. Keep us posted. Thank you so much, Elena, and I really appreciate you guys taking the time. I love Israel and everything that comes out of there. So one of my favorite brands is out of that. So Tycoon Alam literally is one of the best cultivars I've ever had. So they're out in your backyard. So. Yeah, right. One of the first Israeli medical cannabis company. Yes. Great. We'll come and visit next time you're in Israel, sure. And we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Dr. Cody Peterson, and I'm here with Heather Daypre from Americans for Safe Access. Hi, Heather. Hey, Cody. Thanks for joining us on our quick little ditty at the end of the podcast. We're just really excited to highlight all the great work that you're doing at Americans for Safe Access. Can you tell a listener a little bit about what you do at ASA, and, and then we'll get into why that matters? Sure. I run the PFC program at Americans for Safe Access. It is the compliance and training side of uh, ACE's offerings to the industry. And so the PFC program offers compliance courses, educational courses, and we also have a business certification side of things. And our business certification side of things is currently the only ISO 17065 accredited compliance program in the cannabis space right now. ISO what? ISO 176. Can you what? So it's ISO 17065, and it is for certifying bodies for products, processes, and services, which is basically a big fancy way of saying that our audit program has been audited by professional auditors to make sure that we are assessing businesses in a manner that's going to help them become compliant with regulations. Okay. This is good, though. I've heard this. Who's auditing the auditors? And you're telling me that that is happening. The that auditing of the auditors is, I'm going to look into this. Maybe we need an audit audit special team. Anyway, the point is, is you're working with companies to make sure that they are complying with regulations and those co- compliance regulations are set to help patients and consumers make sure that they're getting clean, tested and safe cannabis products. Is that kind of a, a gist? I know that what you're doing on, you know, you're training companies to do this. Is that correct? Or to make sure they comply? Yeah, so the PFC program was actually started because, as you guys know, Americans for Safe Access's mission is to really advance cannabis therapeutics for use in research. And we want to make sure that any patients that are getting this medicine and consumers on the adult use market know that they the products that they're getting have undergone some sort of compliance inspection, whether that's safety testing, that the business that is manufacturing them or cultivating them is operating in a healthy and safe way that isn't going to adulterate or bring contamination into the products. So we provide compliance audits to businesses and, of course, was founded to make sure that, you know, patients have safe access to medicine. It's right there in the name. And the PFC program is a way to help patients and consumers kind of find an identifying mark and label to say, oh, this business is PFC certified. Hey, their products, they've been audited. They've been reviewed. We know that they're making sure that this business is compliant, that employees are safe, that consumers are safe, and that, you know, we're not putting adulterated products or contaminated products into the market. Okay. So you're, you are actually certifying that that manufacturers are following a certain standard and then you're giving a stamp out, right? So consumers can look at the bottle and say, ah, I have a PFC stamp. This is to be trusted. Yep. And we certify all areas of the industry. So we do cultivation, manufacturing, dispensary, and laboratory operations because we want to make sure that all of the products from the entire supply chain have undergone some level of review and assessment to make sure that they are operating according to the PFC standard. 
Oh, looking out for, for patients and consumers, I see again, <laughs> ASA. That's great. I'm glad to hear that consumers need tools to judge a product. You know, one of the things that I hear most is, is this product good? You know, from my loved ones or from a patient, hey, is this one good? And at least uh, it sounds like PFC is giving us some sort of tools for patients and consumers uh, and even healthcare professionals to lean on. So I, I think that that is uh, incredibly important work because right now there isn't a lot of tools out there. There aren't. And it's kind of challenging because, you know, right now the PFC program is a voluntary compliance program. And so it's very hard to get businesses to voluntarily want <laughs> to get assessed. But it is a very important tool in in your production practices to make sure that you have some sort of some sort of external oversight of your operation in the same way that we have external oversight by ha getting audited regularly through ISO and through additional external audits that we get done. Sure. And I'm, I'm uh, audited and, you know, I guess, checked, uh, certified by multiple organizations in the hospital as well, where we serve patients and with medicine. Again, a very similar task. So I can't wait to hear more about what ASA is doing uh, and dive a little bit deeper into what sort of tests PFC might be doing to validate the safety of these products. So thank you so much, Heather, for joining us today. And I hope everyone has a, a lovely week. Thanks. And thank you for having me on here. See you next time. I'm Alana Goldberg. This episode of the Cannabis Enigma podcast was executive produced by myself with production assistance from Dr. Cody Peterson and Ed Weissman and edited by our friends at We Edit Podcasts. If you enjoyed the episode, feel free to like, rate and share. It helps other people find the podcast and it's really nice for us as well. <laughs>